Today, I'm joined by PG County legend, Henry Radar Hall. Welcome to the show, sir. How you doing, everybody? Thank you for joining me, sir. So, No problem. If you could just take us back to when you kind of started to begin to play basketball. Oh, it was a long time ago. Uh, let me give it to you. It was early 80s. Um, I played a lot in my yard. I had a court in my yard where the whole neighborhood kind of came in my yard to play. Those were like the really tough games we were in my backyard. And they were on a – Jay was like maybe we were going on 10 years old. And Ven Clinton Venable, Jay Byers, a couple of friends were like, we're going to the wreck. And I just never went to the wreck. I mean, that I never experienced the wreck before. So uh, he went up there and got Lee Mackins up there, the coach that used to – he was a great guy. The guy used to run Columbia Park wreck. His name was Lee Mackins. He um, came down. They came and told him about me. He came down to my father, to the house, and talked to my father. And my father told him that he would allow me to play, and that was the start of it. And from that point on, I was like I was nine, and I played rec ball all the way till I got to, I got to high school, and that's how that's how it started. So in your playground, you excuse me, in your backyard, you had a half court, a half just, court. Yeah, just just a half court, a lot of dust. <laughs> uh, it, it started off with like 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 a like a bike rim and mop strings. It was just me. I I I, hammer, I knocked all the spokes out of a rim, and put nails through the holes, like two long nails, and um kind of took the mop mop strings off my mother's mop, and she was upset about it. But I was still a mop strings like daily, and, and mm -hmm. putting my, and putting mop strings up and shooting through that through that hoop and putting it like a piece of wood up for a backboard, and finally. I got a real good piece of wood for a backboard, and then that my dad got me a rim one day with the nets. It was one Saturday. He, I worked with him like from five o'clock to maybe like seven thirty to that evening, and mm -hmm. he he had already got it for me, and I didn't know it. And he gave it to me when we got home, and we put it up that evening in the dark. I shot balls maybe to like midnight. Mm. So you said Jay Bias was a childhood friend of yours, and yeah. he kind of he yeah. Came back the coach for you to come up to pick yeah up yes him, him, him and clinton venable were like really key to like me getting to the wreck mm -hmm. so once you got to the wreck how did that kind of turn out where you i think jay was the same but clinton might have been venable should have been older than you right yeah he was one year old he played with troy weaver and them he was they had a okay. good team they had a really good team mm -hmm. and so um, you started go ahead i'm listening and uh we started at, at, at 10 and under and that's how it came in parking. It was me, Jay. It wasn't it wasn't a whole lot of like it was just neighborhood kids. But me and Jay kind of were like just standouts. We kind of played differently, and we just did everything differently. For for a while though, I I stood in the lane for three seconds for like game after game, and got in trouble, and we had to run a lot because of me. And then finally, I got how to play kind of post position, and so I learned a lot. You learn know, you learn through all your trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. So, but were you really good? You must have been really good in the backyard that they wanted you to come up to the wreck, or was it more so that y'all were just friends and they wanted you to be included? No, I never lost in my backyard, so you couldn't do. You could <laughs> like <laughs> so they were like, let me, let me get every other team, <laughs> right? <laughs> so then you kind of had to learn how to play the actual game. Yeah, organized, and, like, organized. And then after you kind of learned the game, you continued to play with Columbia Park up until when you said? Until we got to Parkdale. It was a, I had like a slight hiccup in where I played with, I was in middle school and I kind of played with Northwestern when Bob Wagner was the coach there. Me and Clinton were really close growing up and Clinton was already at Northwestern as a ninth grader and I was an eighth grader. And that mm -hmm. summer, that summer I played with, I played with um, the Northwestern Wildcats with uh, down Sitwell friends. And like, I beat a lot of guys out of their positions or, that were playing for Northwestern at the time. I was just a middle school kid, but Mr. Wagner was, was really a good coach. And he, he trained and taught us a lot. He was in the neighborhood a lot. You know, he, he was with Leonard when Leonard was at Northwestern. So he had all, I had all this faith in him. So didn't, something didn't work out where I didn't end up at Northwestern. They changed the district where I ended up at Parkdale. And that was how that happened at Parkdale. Oh, okay. So you were initially, you were going to go to Northwestern with Jay and uh, Venable at that time. And also, I guess Lynn was still there too, right? No, Lynn, no, Lynn, 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 Lynn was at Maryland. 
okay, got it, got it. So then you kind of you switched over. I guess things didn't work out. You wound up going to Parkdale. So when you got to Parkdale, I guess already you were pretty good. I know you had some youth game experiences in middle school where you kind of bumped shoulders with some other great in the D.C. area. Can you kind of talk about that before you talk about Parkdale? Sure. Um, the, the best experience I ever had playing basketball was youth games. I really, really enjoyed youth games. Um, me and Jay was kind of the neighborhood guys going to youth games. We were the only two guys that played AAU back in the days that were neighborhood guys at our age because, you know, in the, in the early 80s, there wasn't a lot of teams. There wasn't a lot of grassroots stuff going on. So when you got picked for that stuff, you really had to be elite. So we, mm -hmm. we went up to Heinz. We caught the, caught the, uh, the subway to Eastern Market, got off and went to Heinz. And I go in there and it's like a, I'm going to give you the lineup. There's, a, there's me, there's Jay Vice, Mike Tate Young, Donald Ford, even younger, Kurt Smith, younger, the same age as Donald Ford. Then I had Ted Jeffries, Gerard Mustaf, Crawford Palmer. It, the, it was incredible, the team that I was playing with at the time. Incredible. Mm -hmm. And it ended, ended up Donald Ford and Kurt Smith, the two younger players, ended up starting <laughs> like over everybody. It's That's a, crazy. It, it was me, Kurt, Donald Ford, Gerard Mustaf, and who was that fifth guy? Who was the fifth guy? Oh my God, who was that? You said Crawford Palmer. Yeah, Crawford was on the team. Oh, yeah, Crawford started too. Yeah, Crawford okay. started. Crawford was a huge. At the age of 13, he was like six nine already with like size 15 shoes. And oh, it was incredible. We had Brandon Adams as well. Brandon Adams from St. Mm -hmm. John's played on our team. Oh, we had a oh, with George Leftwich that went to Princeton. His dad was one of the mm -hmm. coaches, him, Coach Stan, Bobby, and um, and Oscar Phillips. We had the best coaches. Uh, they paid close attention to us. We our scrimmages were like against like. Melvin Middleton, Sherman Douglas, Adrian Branch, Lynn Bias, Michael Graham. They did, it was it was incredible. <laughs> like Leonard used to break the rim on one end in one week, then Michael Graham would break the rim on the other end of the next week. It was incredible. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was intense. Good. So but you guys were bumping with them when you were like 13, though. Yeah, 12 and 13. 12 and 13. I'm I'm thinking some of the talent that you just named, a lot of those people, I guess, Mike Tate, Gerard Mustafa, and I also want to say Crawford Palmer also became McDonald's All-Americans, right? Yeah, Mike Tate as that. well. Yeah, Mike Tate, Gerard, and Crawford Palmer, all McDonald's All-Americans. But then also in the gym, you, Kurt Smith, Charles Smith, Sherman Douglas, Michael Graham, and Lynn Byers. Yeah, it was incredible. Oh, my great yeah. the, the scrimmages yeah. were intense because we, those kind of guys, when we grew up, you know, we grew up in an era where it was kind of a reach one, teach one. And mm -hmm. we respected our elders. So we we just had to play as hard as we could. And at the end of practice, they the guys helped us. Like they they would pull you to the side and tell you how to get through certain things they were doing to you. And that was a the best thing that ever could happen to me was that that youth game experience. I've never I'd never seen that kind of talent all in one gym at one time, like on both ends. It was like the older guys were incredible i'm gonna add johnny Dawkins to that list too johnny Dawkins will come down to play against us it was like incredible yeah that 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 is that that whole setup sounds incredible because oh. a lot of y'all went on to just to be some of the best in the area that's that's crazy but I, I have this theory that a lot of great players normally rub shoulders with other great players at some point especially when they're young yeah so like now you know they're doing this jordan and lynn bias thing or whatever, and you can kind of see they they kind of rub shoulders before college at a five star camp. Yeah, a lot, you know? a lot in the summertime they used to bump shoulders because they were kind of like on the side of separate teams, and then it would lead his team to the, the end of the week, and so would Jordan, and then there would it would be the, the, the game. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's crazy. So you wind up, you go to Parkdale, and um, I guess because you were very good coming in, but I, did you? get a chance to play varsity in the ninth grade or did you have to kind of earn your way onto the varsity team? Well, you know, Curtis Malone was the point guard at Parkville and the year before I went to Parkville, they were like two and 20. So I, I, really, I really didn't want to play varsity anyway. So <laughs> my friends were going to ninth grade with me from Charles Carroll. 
we were tough in, in middle school. Our middle school team was like undefeated, so we we were trying to stay together. So we added a, a couple of guys added to the team, and we were killing everything on JV. I was averaging like fifty. Mm-hmm. I was like like almost fifty points a game, like forty eight points something on JV for like nine games, and then finally the varsity was kind of not doing well, but they were doing okay. And the coach said, "You you don't have a choice. You got to play up." So, you know, in our day. You didn't play down. You didn't reclass. You played up. Right. So that's what happened. I played up, and I got my burns under me and with Curtis Malone and a couple of the guys I played with, Kelly Rose and Eric, Eric Saunders and Mike Jarman and we and Chucky Wilson. We had a – Reggie. We had a guy that could shoot really good. His name was Reggie. So we got hooked. I got on that team, and it turned out really good for me. We ended up going to the playoffs my freshman year, playing Kennedy. Kennedy was a, a high school out in Montgomery County. He had a guy, deaf guy on the team. His name was Curtis Pride. He was going to play professional baseball at a high school. He was playing with the Mets. His name was Curtis Pride. Mm-hmm. It was, I was an incredible. We lost the game, but it was an incredible experience for me as a freshman. And that kind of catapulted me to understanding that I could just play my game and I would be all right. And Curtis was the point guard. He was really good at pointing it. So, and I was really good at shooting it. So at the time, I didn't really do a lot of dribbling at the time. I just could triple threat, get my, get my shot off, and really get to the rim. But I really could shoot it. So Curtis would set me up, and I would always get shots. And that, that's how that went. So the next year, my sophomore year, it was even better for us because me and Curtis was really close as friends. And I kind of was went through some things at home and ended up staying with him for a while my freshman year. And I ended, you know, ended up not at home for my whole high school experience. I went from college from mm-hmm. my girlfriend's house that I was in, you know, mm-hmm. that, that I lived with at the time. So that was an experience in itself. So doing that with Curtis and ending up on that team with him for two years, the next year I flourished. Like I literally was getting 30s and 40s like on the regular without a three line. So you you kind of developed that. You're talking about you how you guys kind of developed that off the court chemistry that kind of led on to the court for you with him being kind of like a pass first point guard and you're a shooter. Yeah, exactly. Like you know when we grew up back in the days, we could we could go together and play at the rec and get pickup ball and we played against older guys all the time. We I played against grown men when I was 11 and 12, so they taught me pick and roll and how to feed the post and. So all those kind of things that you really need to learn for an IQ to play the game. So when you so you, know, you don't you, get those things playing pick basketball anymore, you you kind of like get trainers and guys are like paying an hour, twenty five dollars an hour for some guy to teach them a couple of moves and a lot of step backs and all kind of stuff that doesn't give you game experience or IQ at all. Right, and you and those experiences to you were very valuable in making you the player that you were. So, you when you went up to when you got pulled up to varsity as a freshman, how many games did you start? Do you remember? Did you immediately start, or did you kind of have to like earn it a well, little? Well, I didn't immediately start. Like, it was a crazy thing because I was a freshman, and they had some guys that were like mm-hmm. seniors, like good juniors and seniors. They were really like vying for that two that that that, that, that two guard spot. So, I literally no, I killed them all the time. And when I got in the games, I was getting twenty points and twenty six and. 23 and those guys didn't get 20 points in the game since they were at Bachdale. Right. So finally, after like four or five games, Curtis just kept fussing and fussing about it where I ended up starting. And that was the, like great. That was so we ended up we playing Crossland. We played Crossland a game that I started, I think. And I had 40 on Crossland at Crossland. As a as a yeah. freshman. And can you kind of just talk to the talent that was in the county during that time because a lot of people will think here you are as a freshman you got 40 you kind of the talent might have been not as good as it is uh in some other times but you know the county was thick during that time yeah. you know you had yeah. Wood, yes the county was really uh, thick State. really yeah. thick yeah can you to that yeah like I'm, I'm like i can break it down okay oxen hill had mike tate and a, 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 a cast of others who were on a football team. And I remember seeing like Dirk Fenner playing and I remember all of that. So I went through all that era and then coming out of that with Mike Tate being unbelievable to check in high school, that's Oxen Hill. So we had High Point, they had Glenson Sydney 
and all of them, and that crew was incredible. Then we go go to Northwestern. Mm-hmm. It was Jay Bias, Venable, David Gregg, Mike Morrison, right on down the line. Thomas Lynch. They mm-hmm. had a great team for years. And then we can go. What's the next thing? Largo. I'm playing against Bryson. Bryson's seven feet in high school. <laughs> like, it's like, come on, man. Like, what are we, what are we doing? Like, it's like, it, it, Forestville had a uh, like a whole crew of athletes. Like. That's back when Forestville athletes, everybody played football, played basketball. So they were physical. Right. They were up in you. Then you would play friendly. I'm playing against the point guard. This guy uh, played with the Redskins I'm playing against. Um, the little point guard, I forgot his name. Um, he was nails tough, too. Uh, oh, what is his name? Played with the Redskins. was a running back. I think he went to William and Murray out of high school, played football. He was incredible. Play, play, play NFL. Trust me. Mm-hmm. And so, it was just, it was, I mean, this everywhere you went, like you played Bowie, you think, okay, we got Bowie. It's not really good school for basketball. A lot of kids don't really go there. I go there. Greg Boy's after twenty six, and he's mm-hmm. about that. Like he's really going to get twenty six every night, and he's trying to do the rest of that too. That's back when if you average mm-hmm. you. When you saw somebody, if they averaged that, they earned it. It was you were getting twos, long jump shots, mid-range, getting to the rim, making free throws, decision making. You had the rebound back then. These guys were, I could do one thing. I catch and shoot. I do this. I do only the ball handling. When we grew up, you had to be like Isaiah. You had to come out of come out of that being Allen Allison. You had to do all those things. You had to. That's mm-hmm. just our era. Our era kind of pushed everything. Like that that whole era. I mean, growing up in that that time when that's when AAU you you played in Baltimore with San Cassell and them. You played Virginia. It was it was Alonzo Mourning and them. You played. It was. I mean, your area of basketball was incredible back then. Like I mean, incredible. Future pros. Future pros everywhere, everywhere. you look. Walt Williams, Gerard. I'm playing Gerard. I'm scrimmaging Gerard at the, the, um, at Parkdale with Demantha incredible like Gerard was Gerard was a phenom like I'm telling you as a, as a child he was a phenom Kurt Smith was a phenom as a child like a phenom like literally Donald Ford another one like I'm naming people who literally could play the game at a high level at 12 like Got it. yeah so, like, that's incredible like I'm, you're, you're able to check Lynn Bias Kurt Smith could handle the ball through all that pressure and get me shots at, at 11. Like, come on. So, so Harry, I kind of want to ask you, I want to, do you, I know you guys had some incredible experience playing against really tough competition early. And I know that you give a lot of credit to that as far as molding you into the player you are, but how much of it do you think is also your talent and how much of, of it do you also believe was your work ethic early on that you kind of learned from the, the older players? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, Brian Waller, his name was Ice. He lived like the next street over from me, from behind me, though. He went to school with Lynn Bias. He played at, he played at Allegheny first. Then he went to Providence and played at Providence for a couple of years with, with Billy Donovan. When, um, I forgot who was coaching. Um, uh, what was his name? Patino. Uh, not, no, but that was, yeah, Patino was at there. Patino was coaching Providence at the time. And he played the backcourt with Billy Donovan. And Dale Ray Brooks had left Indiana and played with them. And that's mm-hmm. it. he kind of molded me in in a real way. Like he taught me how not to play around in the gym. Like I used to be, I, he allowed me to come to the gym and watch him work out with Leonard and Johnny Dawkins, and like a lot of great athletes came in and worked out with him, and and they would play up and down like four on four, three on three, where it was no conversation. It was just grunting and the rim bending and jump shot swishing and game and then the next three next three it was like and i learned how to do that and i kind of translated that in my play i always worked hard i always got shots up i always worked on moves like somebody was always there a lot of it a lot of us I mean, you have some talent i have some talent as well i'm not gonna lie i i could play and i had something in me but mm-hmm. without work none of that would matter like everything is from work everything's so what- from work so what kind of work would you kind of put in behind the scenes, like by yourself? I know you kind of, I'm, I'm pretty sure you moved out of the backyard. 
So where did you kind of like, hunt, you know, kind of develop your game on well, your I always, own? I always had where direct. Going like to- I always had direct. Like I would talk to Mac. This is how serious it was for me. Mac was so into you as a child and watching your development. Like when he saw you getting serious about really the craft, he like gave me the key to the rep. Like only Ice and Leonard and them had keys to the rep. Troy Weaver, Troy mm-hmm. Weaver had a key to the wreck. When I got a key to the wreck, that was not to allow everybody to come in and have a good time. That was for me to get my work in, for me to cut on some music for an hour or two, work hard as I could for an hour or two, and shut the wreck down and leave. He allowed me to do that at an early age. I was maybe 13 doing that. Like I wasn't even in high school yet. But that's how dedicated right. me, Venable, and Jay and a couple of others with, with, with that kind of dedication, he saw, he allowed us to go in the wreck. And then that translated to us allowing like Mike Morrison and then me calling like Mike Tate to come and me calling like certain guys to really, so we can get some real bump in there with just, just us in there quietly, like the way I saw Leonard and them do it. So we started doing that. And that was uh, just growth. Like there was no stunting in anybody. Like we were all, engaged we were all trying to win we all didn't care about each other's names and it just was competition at its finest got it so let's go back to parkdale so now you're a sophomore and you said you had a second season um with curtis malone where you had kind of developed that chemistry can you kind of talk about what your numbers were like because this is your first full season on right and now. um I, I started off like averaging like, I, I was like 26, 27 my freshman year. I ended up like 26 or 27. My sophomore year ended up like 32 because Curtis Curtis was mm-hmm. so good at, at, at getting me the ball. I could, I could really – I started learning from him. I watched his ball handling. I've been around Melvin Middleton. And I was, grew up around guys who could really handle it. Kurt was really good with the ball. So you, I went down Watts a lot and saw – there was a lot of guard play down at Watts down in Southeast. So you mm-hmm. got – a lot of different styles. So I ended up with like a lot of different styles in my game, but with me being so strong and physical and me having a jump shot and being athletic, like I was a guy that could really dunk the ball when I felt like it, shoot from almost half court, like effortlessly. Like I I, I shot set shots Mm -hmm. from back there, like literally don't move my legs, just shooting all wrist and chest. So that's how much push-ups I used to do. And I was really into your body being fit so when that second year came, it was like I was scoring thirties on everybody, like everybody. Like I had to score in the thirty maybe like four, oh. three or four times. It was like twenty eight, maybe I had twenty seven one game, but the rest of the time was thirty two, thirty five, thirty seven, thirty six, thirty one. It was always thirty something. So were you starting to get a lot of attention locally? Doing your sophomore, sophomore year? year. I mean, you got to know, back in those days, you had to earn, like, all county. You had to earn all med. It wasn't – there wasn't a guy on there that you could pluck off and say he didn't deserve it most of the time mm-hmm. because you know he did. So when I finally, mm-hmm. my junior year, made it, it was like a like a rite of, rite of passage. You know, you just had to go through your bumps and you had to, you had to, you had to do it for consistently for a couple of years before you got it. It was no one hit a quitter. You couldn't come in there and average. You could come in there like now kids come in and can average like 20 some points and he's like immediately all met. Like there's no right. way that happened back in the days. So that, that junior year, where did you wind up? I know you weren't first team. What were you? Second, third, honorable mention? Uh, was, fourth team? What, like where did you my, land? My, my sophomore year, I was third team. My junior year, I was second team. And then my first year, I was first team everything. Your yeah, senior year, yeah. first team, right? So you you literally you literally earned it. You yeah. worked your way all the way up. The you got remember that was back in those days when everybody said DC ball was better than Maryland ball and the county ball, and you know you, you had to go through like DC was better than the Catholic school was better than you too, and so I had to earn all those things. Like when I go to Spingon to play, like Spingon and Spingon, my I'm, a, I'm on JV. I get like 56 on them. Like I want to kill them. Like we played the math, at, we scrimmaged the math yeah. at Parkdale in my um sophomore year. Oh, did I just I had like mm-hmm. what, what is it, forty eight on them, right with Morgan Wooden coaching and everything, destroyed them. So let me ask you, because a kid now who does that, 
you know, he would be flooded with transfer offers. Was there any thought of you ever possibly transfer? Because especially with you being so productive early on freshman year, sophomore year, was there ever ever any thoughts of you actually transferring out of the county or possibly out of uh, No, uh, that wasn't even a thought. Like, I come from an era where, where you know, even in professional basketball, where the guy was picked for that team, he stayed with that team. Like, it was like Larry Bird wasn't going to leave Boston. Magic one was never going to leave right. L.A. Dr. J was not going to play with Boston ever. You know what I mean? Like, this is not going <laughs> to happen. Like, they, those right. things didn't happen. Like, I, I come from that era where you you get on that team and you guys, you guys work and you practice and you, and you learn each other and you learn to love each other and play hard together. You don't just walk away from that. That era right. today is like a – they just – like, people come – and they sit in the gym with each other and do this all year and still don't know each other's favorite food, don't know whether he liked the ball in the post or like it in, in the mid-range or, like, you've been with him all year, you don't even know him? Yeah, and then on top of that, I, like you said, I, you had actual friends who came in with you at Parkdale who played with you at Parkdale. So I guess that was a part – it would be tough to walk away. Yeah, really tough. Like that. It was really tough. But then I had great coaches. I mean, you know, back then – it, a, lot, a lot wasn't told to me skill wise. I, I think I, I learned a lot from Brian Waller. So my skill set was tough, and I, I, I always wanted to. You know, you remember John Battle? I used to lift on his jump shot. That's the way I used to mm-hmm. get to my mid range shot. I used to lift like that, and and shoot deep like Freddie Brown from the Sonics, and like <laughs> I just looked at different guys. Like you know, I Kobe say he kind of looked at different guys. It wasn't always the guy. It was always somebody that just caught your attention mm-hmm. because he could do what he did all the time. That's what I looked at. I looked at those kind of guys. So that's what I always wanted to be. I always so wanted kinda, to be that guy. You took you took pieces of their game and added, added it every yours. Like me going to UTEP. I go, I, I go to visit. I'm Tim Hardaway's down there. So, okay. okay. No, no, hold okay, up, Henry. Okay, okay, don't okay, get okay, out okay, of okay, 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 okay. <laughs> You know, we talked about that before. I love that. Story. I, I got to okay. get that out. Okay. <laughs> I got to get that. But I want to go back to Parkdale real quick. because so now yes. you're a junior. And, you know, the uh, sophomore year averaging 20, I think you said 32. Junior year, how much did you, what kind of uh, numbers like did you 30, do? I was like 36, 37. As a junior. And this, so this is now 87. And this is the year before the three-point line. So you're pumping in. 37 yeah, a game. Like 36, 30, like 36 points a game. That's back, you know, when you had to, you literally had to lead your team and you couldn't do it like taking 100 shots. Mm-hmm. Like, it had to Efficiency. be that. Like, I, I couldn't shoot on the 50%, or we weren't going to win the game anyway. So, and this is also your first yeah, year without so Curtis, I was learning, right? This is me with the ball in my hand. And I'm trying to maneuver through it at high school. Like, and I'm not Curtis, but I led in my own way. Like, I, I led with, like, my desire and my passion. And my I was always verbal in the gym. I could always talk to my teammates and get them to, to come along and play and that kind of thing. Because I grew up with Jay, and Jay was always lazy. So you had to beg him to get to the gym. Once he got to the gym and got ready, he, oh, he was going to beat Jay Bias. But before that, oh, no, it was no dice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not the same. Gym. <laughs> so, so like, it, I, I, I kind of want to go back because another thing that kind of struck me about your story is you you did so much so early. Was there ever any jealousy uh, from other players, especially older players on the team that you might have had to deal I with? I felt jealousy when I got to Utah. That's when I felt it. They okay, could, I never really thought anybody could like. I, I'm gonna keep it real, like. When I played basketball, and I'm, this is not being cocky, but when I got to a certain point in my game, I just didn't see anybody really strike, really stopping me from doing what I wanted to do anyway. So, so I didn't see – like, right. I played against Delonte Taylor and DeBella, and I played against John Battle and Haywood Workman and Enos Watley, and I used to – I didn't really have a – I'm not going to say I did, just well, I did. I, did I, I, I had my way with a lot of people, so that's what happened. <laughs> hey, Henry. Hey, Henry. <laughs> so you you're now a junior. You're pumping in these points pre uh, three point line. 
now as a senior, you have the three point line. And I know that you, you know, you've spoken on that before that it wasn't really much of a difference to you. It's just now you were getting extra points from shooting for from just as far yes. as you were before. But I, I kind of wanted to ask you, um, with that three point line mentally, did it kind of impact you at all? Like just now knowing that it was there, or were you just you just didn't even pay any attention to it? You just went and played your game to get the same game you've been playing. Yeah, I never I never really saw that. Like as a as a like a I played without that line so long that when it when it got there, it was just right. It was just another line on the court to me. I I never shot from that close anyway, unless I was dribbling into a sweet shot, a mid range, or like even back then to me that that three line was like a like a sweet shot for me. Like I literally could like shoot free throws from there. So it didn't really right. bother me. So it didn't bother you at all. So in that senior year, you averaged what exactly? It was 40, 10, and 10. 40, so you averaged a triple-double yeah. Yeah. coming yeah, in, 40. as a senior. And you know how – I think you know how I feel about that class of 88 oh. nationally. So here you, here you are. You're averaging 40, 10, and 10. I think you were one of the top scorers in the country that year as well. Do you remember, I think, top three? But do you remember the other uh, two guys by any Chris chance? Chris Jackson. He was in um, – yeah, he was in well, Gulfport, Mississippi. And mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, it was Sean Kemp, Sean Kemp in Elkhurst, Indiana. Got it. So both of them were uh, yes. McDonald's yeah. All-Americans. Yeah. So I, I, I know I know you have a lot of respect for Chris Jackson. I kind of want to talk on that because I know you, you had a run-in with him or maybe several at the Nike camp. Can you kind of talk about – I know you're – everyone acknowledges that you're a cookbook, but everyone also acknowledges that he's a cookbook as well. So can you kind of talk about what it was yeah. like facing him? He, yeah, I had a, I played up him there? twice up there. And he um, – I beat well, – I won game and he won a game. But – the game that I won, I mm -hmm. also had Sean Kemp on my team. So no one was taking Sean Kemp. Like <laughs> Sean Kemp would like literally run right. the point, do everything. Like he did after a while, he didn't need anybody to play with him. Like he just do him. But yeah, yeah he was, he was way a little different. different. Than he was alone. way you're, different. Yeah, Rob, as far as the big tree and all them, like he was just on another plane, just on athletic, a, athletic, a whole another guys. planet. Like even. Like Alonzo Mourning couldn't check him. He was that good. He was that good off the dribble. Right. He could shoot it. He could get to a shot, shoot it. He could play in the post. He was crazy athletic. Like incredible athletic. Yeah. Like I'm talking like Dominique Wilkins at that size. Yeah. Yeah, legit. Logistic ten, ten, everything right? on him long. He just hands down by his knees. He walked like like a pray mantis the whole nine, man. He was incredible to see play basketball. Incredible. So you you had Sean Kemp on your team. And so you was running through early. Like, end of the week, I didn't have him early. But the first game I didn't have him. And um we played Chris mm -hmm. Jackson and oh my God. And I didn't kinda I didn't know he was kind of twitching out there and looking kinda, you know, I didn't I didn't respect it. So I go out there, I hit the first three, boom. I come down here to three on him. So he didn't. He doesn't talk. He didn't say a word. He rattled off for like four or five plays where, like, like I I was nowhere <laughs> near him on the jump shot. Like, like he was so open. <laughs> it was like I wasn't even there. Like one time he went through. He hit me with a double between the legs one time so fast and lift with the lift. And that's back when he like was lifting with his kneecap was in your face on a jump shot. You get the defensive, you're the defensive stands. When he gave you something and then lifted, you yeah. were not getting a hand nowhere near his face. If you were six foot guard, no six foot guard was checking him. None of I don't even want to hear nothing about it. And he won the dunk contest at Nike Camp. So was that your your senior? You're going into your senior year. That was your first experience no, at Nike. Or did you year. go to previous year and too? Jay had, and Jay, Jay convinced me to go. So I first... wasn't really a camp guy. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like. I didn't like to really get away that getting away from the neighborhood and kind of things that like that happened to me later. Okay, got it. So uh in playing Chris Jackson, we know you're a you know a prolific score. He's a prolific score. Uh what would you say was the biggest difference between you two at that 
age because you were athletic. Yeah. He was athletic. You you were quick, good off the dribble. He was good, quick off the dribble as well. Both you know could shoot shoot long range. So what would you say was the biggest the difference? difference with his game was it was more it was, it was quicker. He played with a quicker pace than I did. Like like and he could mm-hmm. he could he could bring it. Like I could score from oh I could bring the ball and score. I could run point and score. I could get off of it, get off screen and score. Those kind of things were like enhanced in my game. He was literally if you just give him the ball, he was like a dude. It could just dribble all oh, this. His handle was better than mine. I didn't get a handle, so I got a view tip. So he already had that. Okay. When I played point at Parkdale, I was literally yeah. breaking pressure and seeing open people, but breaking pressure so I could see the rim. Like, <laughs> that was the whole purpose of me to get over. Right. So, uh, that Chris Jackson experience, did you take anything away from that? Was he the best guard up there? Because I think also uh, that should have been – Kenny yeah, Anderson's I didn't see Kenny. Year. Kenny wasn't there. Kenny, where well, if he was there, he wasn't like doing like he wasn't in the big games or anything like that. Got it. So was Chris definitely yeah. the best guard yeah, of there that year? Was. He definitely was because I didn't. I didn't play. I didn't play really good until the end of the week. Like I played good like after Wednesday because I was kind of gun shy. I didn't really. Mm-hmm. Did, guys were like, you know, in camp, everybody's dribbling the ball and taking off, and you, know, you got a seven foot. He get a rebound on coast to coast. Like, like I was like, what the world is he doing? Like, 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 pass the ball. Like, what are you doing? Right. And I didn't realize he knew how to play at camp until that experience. Got it. So, uh, you're now a senior at Parkdale. You're averaging, you know, forty. But when we look back at that, you've been you're probably the most prolific scorer in the Washington D.C. area since '88. No one has come close to touching that, even with the three-point line. So, you know, a lot of talk has been talked about Jordan, if he was dropped in this era right now in the NBA. But if we were to drop a 12th grade Henry Hall into a private, the WCAC, or even the public school back, you know, back at Parkdale or back in the PG County public schools, like, what do you think you would average now? now? Oh, I would – there's nothing. There's nothing there for – for guys like a like like me like a, uh, or you remember a guy um what's his name Ortega what's his name um oh what's his name uh yeah Ve- oh my god like, I, yeah like like from, from McKinley like machine like literally like like guy it would we were different like we were like cut differently like like we just would have ripped this up like it's too soft everything is soft like I like these guys they call shooters can make like three or four shots in a game. Like I was making through four or five threes in a quarter. Plus getting to the rim. Right. Plus finding my teammate. Plus rebounding. Plus being the loudest on the court. Like the whole nine. Like these guys are doing like bits and pieces of the, of the game. They're not no one's like completely being a complete basketball player anymore. I, I find that amazing. Like I'm trying to teach my son that now that that you have to be completely everything. You got to be able to do everything. So what I know, you know, I know you like you said you have a son that currently plays in high school. I know you've been following the game because you're a true fan of the game and you love it. But what do you think has basically changed where kids now aren't exactly like you said they aren't as complete as basketball players, even though they have more resources uh, provided to them. What do you think has been the biggest change? I know you mentioned previously that playground was really big for you playing with older people, but what do you think you know has really changed that? that? That 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 mess up like the game today the way it is. And, and one of them is really like not having playground basketball. That that's really a key factor. Number two, there's there's no there's no elder statesmen around anymore. There's no guys that are running recreation center teams and they've they've been there 20 years and they've always produced kids to go to certain schools and and AAU being such a money machine is another thing. And then too much parents, mm-hmm. too much parents, just too much parent, parental anything. Like when I grew up, when I grew up, my father never seen me play too basketball, much. not one game my whole life. So there was no parental influence talking to the coach, talking that. to whoever. You I mean, earned it because yeah. you did it. 
you went through the coach. You right. had to deal with the coach. You learned how to deal with a grown man who was different from your father. You had to learn that. The world is that way. Why do you think all this stuff is happening with these kids now? Yeah. They don't, they can't hear no. They only can listen to girls and women. They like, like, like what, what in the world is that? Yeah. Like, are you serious? Yeah, they, they do, they, they kind of respond to a softer tone. And then anything that's considered aggressive is considered harsh and not good for them which is they can't even accept criticism and sometimes feedback about their game, even it when it's matter. coming from a genuine place. Like, I'm pretty sure, exactly, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, Coach Waller got on you about certain things, but you took it and you learned yeah. from it and it made you better because it came from a genuine place. Now, if it comes from a genuine place, they don't yeah, kind of know different. how to think. Like, like, I, like you said, uh, Brian Waller being someone who took me to the gym by myself, and every time when he put me out of the gym, like he told me, like we're passing to each other. And like we're shooting like 20 shots in a row in different spots. So he's making like 20, 19, 19, 17, 18. So I get done, I'm making one, nine in this one, 11 in that one. Like, like, like he's like, I'm going to tell you, Henry, if I have to chase the ball all over the place, then you're not going to be in here with me. So I, 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 I had to learn yeah, to deep. even bubble shots, like they almost, almost always go in. Or switch him. Or there's no way I could be in the gym. Mm -hmm. There's no way. I couldn't it's talk. Now. But a kid now yeah. a kid now wouldn't come back. Some kid, let me say this. Let me say this. Some kids now wouldn't come back. I don't want to say all of them, because not all of them, but there are certain kids definitely and some elite kids who you would not that. respond you know well that. to that. But you know, you know, I know you play playground basketball and I know you know, I know you We've had conversations. You are a Maryland guy. Like, you have no problem with that. You don't try to be, you know, I'm from D.C., I'm this, that. You you clearly know there's a distinction between PG and D.C., especially back then. But I know you played a lot of D.C. Right. playground basketball. And I know you, you know, you played with Kurt Smith, who's considered a legend in D.C. And I had this theory where Kurt Smith literally only respects two basketball players, and that's you and his brother. And <laughs> that's it. Everybody else, the younger guys, his son, and uh, the people who are close to his age, he pretty much ran through them. So he doesn't really see them as opponents. But I have noticed the conversation that he holds you at a high regard um, as far as the basketball player. Can you kind of talk about that relationship? Because I know you guys kind of, you know, met at a young age and kind of kind of grew up in the game. We're in the same situation playing against older guys. Sure, no problem. So can um, you kind of talk about that? Me, for the first time, seeing uh, like Kurt, he was small. On top of him being, like like, young, he was kind of small. But he was thick, but he was kind of small. He was nothing like Smitty. Smitty was real long and light skinned. Right. He was kind of brown and short and thick. And I'm like, <laughs> look at this kid, and he's like, right. can handle the ball, run the play, get this ball to the right person, take the right the runner in the lane. I mean, just I was so impressed by him that I started like like we started being really friends. So we became really close friends when he was like. Maybe ten. I maybe mean, was what was it? What was it? Eleven or ten or twelve and eleven, and we were close from that point on. I would go down to mm -hmm. Watts. We would hang out, and I would ride with him. We would just ride around and play everybody in the city. That like everybody that Kurt thought was talking too much trash, me and him. Well, he would put me in the car, and I would just go and destroy him. You know, <laughs> so, like <laughs> and he, he would <laughs> laugh and tease and bet money and do all kind of stuff. Kurt was crazy. But he was my best, like, my best buddy, like, playing basketball as a point guard and a guard playing together besides Clinton Venable, who I never really got to play with. Playing, playing with Kurt was, was, a special, mm -hmm. was a special relationship because we could, we, we didn't have to, we didn't have to see each other. We, I could get on the court with him, and he knew where to get me the ball. He knew what I was going to do. He, and he knew certain things about me in my life that kept us really close. I knew his family. He knew what I was going through. I knew what he was going through. We just, the bond never, mm -hmm. never breached from that. Like we never breached the bond. And on the, on the court, we had to have respect for each other because I saw him kill people. He saw me kill people. And I always respected him for that. Like game, respect, right. game. So, you know, we're Smitty being his brother and he's a defensive test. And then, you know, you growing up 
um, up under uh, Clinton Venable. I guess, you know, with you two playing against them and them picking you up, no high school guards are really going to give you any real trouble. Right. That, that's exactly older, what it was. See, right. You remember in our era, we played up a lot. We played, we went to places and played against men. We went to get places played against where the all met guys were hanging out at and the, the guys in the city who really could play. We wouldn't got that. If it was outside, we would go up cold. We'd go up college park and play at night at midnight and play against the college guys. I used to go up there and play against T.R. McCoy and Keith Gatlin and all of them when I was in, like in middle school, going into high school. So that we used to go do that. Like everybody wasn't doing that, but real ballers were doing that. That real bump. Yeah, they was getting that real bump in. So, so you graduate I, Parkdale. What's I'm next? I'm going through the recruiting process, and I'm I'm heavily recruited, and I I really thought I should have went to Vegas. Like I I wanted to go to Vegas, but but everybody in the neighborhood, Matt, my father, everybody that I talked to was saying go to Georgetown, go to Georgetown. Really wasn't my choice. I love Patrick Ewing and I love Georgetown, but I didn't think I wanted to play for somebody who was like my dad. Like me and my dad went through some things as me growing up, and that's why I was away from the home. So John Thompson was exactly like the same thing. He just wasn't West Indian doing it. Right. So during that time, though, I guess the pressure for a local kid, especially one as talented as you, to go to Georgetown yeah. was extremely incredible as well, right? Especially with them in the winning program and, you know, Coach Thompson being such a – Yeah, know, it hurt me when Lefty, um, when Lefty lost the job. It, that bothered me because I really didn't didn't know Bob Wade. I, I mean, and he I, I didn't really trust him. Like, I didn't trust Bob Wade. He just didn't seem – I'm not saying the guy was – anything was wrong with him. I, did, I mean, I think he's a great guy now and he's a grown man. But as a 17-year-old, I didn't know him. I didn't really know anything about him, and I didn't trust him to go to Maryland enough to go to Maryland. I was going to go to Maryland if Lefty was coaching it. We all were going to Maryland, all of us, me, Walt, Gerard, oh. Venable, Jay. Everybody was decided when we were young that we all was going to end up in Maryland. We all said it to each other while we were playing ball at the Rex and stuff. Yeah. And we, if we did that, that would, like, make Maryland great, and we would always talk about things like that. So that was that was only if Lefty stayed though. So it was it came down for you to Maryland, Georgetown, yeah. and UNLV. So you chose Georgetown, and then um, well, so what kind of happened with that situation? Yeah, it was you a lot going not, on. You decided I mean, not to do it in my life at the time, and with me going to Georgetown, me hanging, me hanging out with John Turner, and me playing at the summer league with the Tombs, and you know all those things were happening. So when school started, it it was it wasn't a good mix for me. I didn't really like the lady, Miss Finland. She wasn't really really she wasn't really nice to me personally, mm -hmm. and I didn't like being spoken to. But you know, I I came up in a home where I was being you know a lot of things were going wrong. So I didn't really accept it after I left the home to be spoken to <laughs> in a derogatory way all the time. And I like to be called I like to be called by my name. Like right. I was a respectful kid. I wasn't like a kid that didn't didn't like coaching. I love coaching. I love direction. I love to be told what to do. If you need me to do that, then I'm going to do that. But not the way I was being. I don't like the way I was being treated at Georgetown. So I left. So you yeah. So you played Kenner League that summer. How'd you do? Well, how'd you yeah, do Dennis that? Dennis averaged that thirty three. I averaged thirty one. <laughs> So then you decided that you weren't going to go to Georgetown. Um, was that like a big thing at that yeah. time when you kind of yeah, was like, you know, I'm not doing this? Or was it kind of, kind of just – It was a big thing under because he, um, it was a big thing. I okay. remember him coming back from the Olympics. He was in, I think, in Colorado somewhere to talk to me about uh, talk to me about staying. Mm -hmm. and we, and, and you, and I you just told big, do it. You like, told I, big I John you can't so, do this. Like I don't mean I don't want to I don't want to dog with John because I love John Thompson. He's a great guy, and we end up being close friends now. But back then, the story is, and, and and this is a true story that he didn't release me from Georgetown because he told me I was either going to go to USC or stay at Georgetown, and I wasn't going to go to USC go play with Joe Ravelin, and I wasn't staying at Georgetown. So he, I, I had to sit out for a whole year. I sat oh, out Ravel, for a whole year after that. Ravelin was his man. Yeah, him and Dad. I think they coached him and his man? together and everything. Okay. 
Got it. So you so you said at yeah. that particular time you were gonna sit out the entire year. So yeah. you wanted so how much did you play that day. year you were kinda of off? Did you I was play every day? I was gonna play basketball kind of, whether okay. it was for college, it was for free, it was for money, it didn't matter. Basketball, I was going to the wreck and play every single day. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I don't know if people know your story. So I, I think that some people think that when you left or you walked away from Georgetown that you were kind of inactive and you didn't really play. But you played every day exactly. with and that's the goal of still playing in, in college, day. right? And Jim Bad News Barnes, he played for Texas El Paso. And he was they had an and one team at the time. He was coaching an and one team. And he asked me, did I want to play? He knew who I was immediately. And he said, uh, hey, Henry, what you doing home? And I was like, oh. Uh, didn't work out at Georgetown. He said, well, why didn't you go somewhere else? I said, well, he didn't release me. And he wanted me to go to USC, and I didn't want to go there. And, you know, he said, well, oh, that's just a shame, man. So he just started talking to me about Texas El Paso, and I was like, I don't even know what that is. So he said, well, just hang around. You want to play some games? I said, yeah, I don't mind playing. So I killed, it. I killed this and one team. So the next day – When you say and one team, it's not what people think – when they no, think this, street is, ball, this, this is, is the so first like exactly. the couple of street ball team when they first started coming together. The N one, yeah, it was a, oh. it was a, it was. A, they had started that a long oh, okay. time ago, where they were getting a bunch of guys from different cities and trying to bring them together. Okay. But they, when they started with us, when it started early, when I grew up, it was the guys from the same city, like Herbo teams. Like they were like the best Baltimore teams would come down and play at the Herbo against whoever was down here in DC. And vice versa. Right. So it was yeah. still, it was and it still was called AM1? Yeah, it was oh, okay. AM1. Wow, so I he, never I knew killed that. Him and he said, so, dude, dude, he talked to me about UTEP, then he told me to watch a game tonight. He was coming back the next day. He told me, I'm coming back the next day, and I'm going to bring one of the coaches from UTEP. And I was like, didn't you just tell me that was in El Paso, Texas? So he was like, yeah, the guys will come out here. I said, come out here to see me, and I don't even want to go there? Like I, I like I did I, I couldn't believe he would do it. Like I was like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> so he said, Well, watch the game tonight. So uh, Tim Holloway's playing somebody in the whack. It was channel 56. Well, back, you know, back then we had channel 56, 45, 50, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, 20, 8, 13, 20. Those those channels. <laughs> so I watched him. He's on a late, real late at night. Game mm-hmm. started. Me and my friend Tracy Weaver went out of the basement watching the game. It's like eleven o'clock it started. So I'm watching this guy, Tim Hardaway. And I'm watching Antonio Davis and Greg Foster. And I'm like, yo, who's this guy with the ball? Like, like he was like attractive to watch. Like he literally played in a like a brass kind of cocky way, but he could handle it really good, was strong, in control, could shoot it, could get to the rim, find his teammates. I loved it. So he came, Jim Barnes came the next day with the other team, and I called Venable and a couple of other friends that were were they were just like home for the weekend. It was like a Friday when I played him. So Saturday, a couple of guys came home. Venable was in Allegheny, I think, and a couple of guys that came home. And I said, y'all come to the wreck. We're going to play these guys from AN1. They think they tough. So <laughs> so when they came the next time, we had I had my own five. So we destroyed that team. And I didn't – I never really talked to anybody before that. I just kind of was in the gym. He came in with his team. I kind of was like, yeah, we're going to eat these guys alive. I was kind of – I mean, I was the loudest one in the gym. So I'm like, yeah. Let's go, Yada. So finally, we started playing. I just destroyed them. So after the game, that's when I, I, I introduced to uh, Russell Bradbury. And he was an assistant coach at UTEP. And he was like, yo, Henry, I mean, we we love the way you play, man. Are you serious? What, what are you doing home? So I told him what happened. He was like, are you serious? So he couldn't believe it. So he's like, listen, man, um, we would love for you to come out and visit. I said, visit what? He said, well, visit UTEP. I said, um, he said, you watch the game? I said, yeah, I love that guy, Tim Hardaway, man. He can really play. He said, yeah, yeah. We'll let you kind of play the same kind of game. And then I said, oh, for real? I said, okay. So I went on a visit and loved it. Like, I went on a visit and I just loved it. The first, thing I, I, the first thing I saw when I got to the campus was, for the first time, and I'm going to tell you something. This is going to be funny. But I've never seen Latina women before and they <laughs> were out not if you grew if, if you grew up 
If you grew up in PG and DC back then, I definitely can understand. It was like four or five of them sunbathing in front of the oh my god and topless oh i was done i said i will sign tomorrow i couldn't <laughs> i couldn't believe what i saw and then the visit was incredible i had the best visit tim hard on them show with the best time oh it was incredible so i was ready to go from that point mm-hmm. i was at utah So can you kind of talk about? I know uh, Hardaway yeah. was there. Was that, he a that, senior yeah, was, that yeah, year? Yeah, a senior. Going yeah, that year, that right. I went to the visit. He was the senior year had just ended. No, matter, no matter of fact, matter of fact, he was going into a senior year. Right. So he, he, yeah, going into it. Okay. So, um, can you kind of talk about what happened on the visit? Yeah, I'm can you gonna talk about the one on one game. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't share the story with everybody. <laughs> I'm gonna let you know, man. This is that's a prideful thing, but I'm. I, I'm at UTEP. I get down there on the visit, man. And I understand. I'm, I'm full of joy. I'm happy. I can't believe it. And I see the guy on TV that I like. He's real cool. But he's dogging D.C. He's saying, well, ain't nobody from D.C. can check me, man. And blah, 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 blah. And Sherman Douglas ain't this. And Smitty ain't that. And I said, man, I kill you. Who are you talking to? And he's like, I'm talking to you. I said, you ain't talking to me, man. I'll bust your little... He was kind of like, looked like he was a little smaller than me. So I'm talking crazy to him. So I say, man, what you want to do? He said, what do you want to do? I said, man, we can one-on-one whenever you want to do that, man. So I'm, I've am i never lost really one-on-ones. I really don't lose one-on-one game. So, so we get over to the gym. He said, coach, get this dude some gear, man. I'm going to show DC something, man. So so he, he, that's how his voice was kind of like, they called him Bug back then. They was calling him Bug. Hey, Bug, what you going to do to the freshman, man? He said, I'm going to introduce him to the whack, man. So, <laughs> so we get over to the gym. So he's talking. I'm warming up, stretching a little bit, hit some open jump shots, handle. So I said, are you ready, man? So he said, yeah. I said, he said, you want to hit the hit or miss? I said, you go ahead, man. So top of the key is where we shoot there to miss. He was three steps behind that. And he shot that, didn't hit the rim. So that's my first impression. I'm like, <laughs> wow. Like, he shoots where I shoot at, like, easy. So I'm thinking, all right, that's why I shoot anyway. I'm like, well, that's one thing we right. have in common. But I'm going to still kill him. So he goes into his the handles. And I mean, when I tell you he is strong, he was really strong, man. Like strong, upper body, chest and shoulders, just bumping me around, throwing it behind his back. He hit me with the two-step. Mm-hmm. Man, I literally, like, danced out of the – like, if it was a camera, I would have been out, the, out of the camera site. Like, I literally was, like, gone. He was laying. He was talking to me, laying it up the whole time, like oh, finger rolling. Yeah. Man, I wish he was playing a little more D out here, man. And why he hadn't shot it yet? That's how open he was. So, so let me ask you about that two step, that you step two step. You seen crossovers. You played with Melvin. You played with Kurt. You know how how was that so much different for you when you got kind of well, introduced that two step, two step yeah, man, on that yeah, trip? Man, you do the DC crossover. That's just a cross. That two step is you can do multiple right. like counter moves off the two step. Like I can come straight down and just throw it through my legs fast and beat you. I throw it through my legs and pull up. Then I start mm-hmm. doing that to you. I throw it through my legs. You can react to that. I throw it through my legs and then cross over. That's when you fly out the play. I mean, it was just a lot of counters you could do with doing that two step because it was more than just that one thing. It was more than just throw it through your legs and cross over. Cause you could you could just you could throw through your legs and go behind right. your back and cross over. You could you could do it either side. It was a just a lot of counters. I loved it more so than the DC way. So when I came home that summer, I just was ripping people. I just ripped, 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 ripped. And I was and I was a little taller. I grew a little bit. I was much way more way more in shape than I than I had ever been. Like Don Haskins ran mm-hmm. us to death. I mean, like literally. Like, I was like, oh, my God, I was going to quit college basketball. <laughs> In fact, several days, I almost wanted to quit college basketball. He killed us. So, so just going back, so he beat you one-on-one. Did you, and you said he no, was headed into his senior that, year. That's year. Did you, were listen, you there with him? When I, when, I, when, I, when I went on the visit, his senior year was going on. Yeah. Yeah, oh, got yeah, it. it was going got on. It. So, so he was, he, I, he was graduating that year. This is before draft and all this other stuff. This is the like end of the season. Like this is like 
when I finally get down, like I went on multiple visits to UTEP. I went on that visit one time, then I go on another visit. And this is one the one visit I went on when I was talking trash to him. Like I was like, yeah, I'm like, that, you're not doing nothing. So I put on all this UTEP gear and got the rapping and he beat me 16 to nothing. Like zero. Nothing. It, 16 no, no, so no. How Somebody how you, asking that was. You only played back. the one game? He said, you can, he told me you could take out the sign. Right. Mistake. Mistake, right? So that was a mistake. I triple play <laughs> him. Like I'm way yeah. back. And he is, I'm some old. He, now, he didn't already see me play a little bit. I'm out playing pickup ball down there a little bit. So he liked what I mean. He liked how I play, but he kind of talking trash because he's way stronger and way more knowledgeable of the game. So he's doing stuff to me I, that hasn't been done that way. Like, I've never been played by a point guard full court in a one-on-one right. game. Like, we taking the ball out, like, almost by half court. He's, like, right there. Like, only one that ever done that was, like, Muggsy, uh, Clinton Venable, and Ernie Hall from Mutto from Baltimore. They're going to yeah. sit all the way down, man. He did that. Yeah, they're going to sit down. Like, and, I've never yeah. seen anybody do that and be that strong and physical and fast. And then be able to check me and be on my jump shot like that. So he beat me again, sixteen to nothing. What? Twice, Joe. I ain't gonna lie to you. Not, he beat I, you twice, sixteen nothing. It, 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 it's just still bothering <laughs> me to this day. Hey, Henry, he was special you. though, man. To this day, it still bothered me that I lost to that dude twice with a uh-huh. donut, Joe. He got the ball when yeah. he got, I missed the first shot. Like I, I dribbled on him and so the shot I pulled that, up, it bubbled. Like, it literally went in and went out. That's how bad I, I wanted that shot to go in. You know it went in. It went all the way in and then bubbled out. He got the rebound and said, that's the last time you're going to touch it. And he meant it. That's crazy. Hey, but look, you know, what, you know what's crazy about that, though? I was talking to uh, Jones, and he, he said him and Steve, when they played their one-on-one, it was almost the same. It was like yeah. whoever got it first won it. And then, I mean, they just they just ran off points. Nobody scored. It was That's like right, it was yeah. like thirty two nothing first game or something. And then he came back and beat Steve. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. crazy how elite players can do that. Yeah, man. So that didn't nah, that like didn't turn it. you I mean, off like, as far as going to Utah. He was talking. He, he was talking trash, and I really engaged in competition. Like that was my thing. So the whole season, I'm like I'm watching him. We he mm-hmm. has like a. He had the exhibition game at UTEP. He had two exhibition games at UTEP. Like, so he could we could all see him play. He played Utah down there. He played um played somebody, he played Stockton, he played another guard. I forgot his name. Um the guy was sorry though, he killed him. So the end of that summer, he was at UTEP again. He come down and visit. So I've been I'm there. I, I mean I'm I stayed at, I stayed at, I stayed at school during the summertime most of the time. So I'm down there with him and we working out, working out, working mm-hmm. out. So we never say play one on one, never. We never said. So no, no. So no. Listen. So finally, finally after that, that was that was play one on one. So he said, "You ready for this, man? I'm, I think I'm a little better than I used to be, man. You gonna get killed this time even worse." I said, "No, nah, I, I don't got you doing that, scrub." Like that, right? So we go at it. We go at it. <laughs> so he be sixteen to eight. But for me. Yeah, he beat me sixteen to eight. But for he beat that, you, he beat for me, a third time, and I and I was doing stuff to him that I was I had never done before. Like I was handling the ball. I was I hit him with the two step, messed him up, hit him with his own mm-hmm. zone. I said, yeah, 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 take that with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I really lost. It wasn't like he beat. <laughs> so me. you like had gotten I, better. I lost the game by missing shots too. It wasn't like a he just beat me. Like the first two games. He just beat the hell out of me. Like, I literally didn't touch the ball for, like, 30 minutes. Then it was the other game was, like, 20 minutes. He was even faster because he shot jumpers. He's like, he literally shot jumpers on me with me. I smacked him in his face one time on a jump shot, and it did not hit the rim. I literally couldn't believe it. And everybody <laughs> was in the gym. The whole team, some girls. The girl was there. The topless girl was there. Oh, my God, Joe. The top, the girl I saw topless came to the came to the gym, yeah, and it was it was a big deal, man. It was a big deal when I came down there. Like they had it, like I was at the airport. They had this big thing at the airport, and I was there, and I was on the news. And it was a big deal. So everybody kind of was there. When I went in the gym, 
that was a big deal. When he beat me to death in front of everybody, oh, man. Humbling, though, but made me work. So it made you, made you much better. So you, you come home and you go back, and you now you're going to Utah. Two. So do, how many seasons at Utah? Yeah. One, two. So two seasons. So what kind of happened after that second season? <coughs> Excuse me. That you know you I went in as a freshman. So what play. happened? You went in as a freshman year, or a sophomore? I go in and I'm having a great time killing. So my sophomore year, I come home from my sophomore year that summer, and I didn't come home a lot. I came home for like maybe three weeks. So Jay Jay picks me up. Like Jay picks me, Jay picks me up. Jay Bias picks me up, and I, I drop my bags off to mm-hmm. my father. And then when I, I go see them. And I've never went back home. I was with Jay for like the whole three weeks. So I only went back to my father's house to scoop up my bags and go back to school. So we get to the airport. I'm like, I'm wondering right. why like both of us are crying like babies. And like, I'm all, I, I don't want to say a lot of names that I was around, but I was around some different people that you know, I'd rather not say, but I was around them and they, they were looking right. at us crazy. Like, what's wrong with y'all, man? So mm-hmm. I cried all the way to Chicago airport. When I got from DC all the way to Chicago O'Hare, I, 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 I was in tears. Like, I don't know what the world that was, mm-hmm. why I thought something was wrong, why I wasn't going to see him. And then he died. And then, oh, yeah, we, so, so he dropped you off. Yeah, we, like, we spent that whole season. He, 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 he dropped you off like, at the hanging airport? Out the whole time. He... And then, we all go to the airport, like my whole friend, all us that right. was hanging out, we all go to the airport together to drop Mio back off to go back to El Paso. So my coach, my coach tried to get him to go. Like, I got Don Hassan on the phone trying to get right. him to go to Utah. He's telling him he can stay with me in my apartment. He'll give him the same thing I got. He can live with me. He can come on scholarship. The whole Jay did not want to go to school at the time. So I go, and I'm emotional. Right. I didn't know why I was emotional. So I get to school. So months go by, season by the start. So season starts and he dies. He gets killed. So yeah, my sophomore year. So I was just Is this soft- super crushed. Year, like I literally like- stopped going to classes, stopped playing basketball. I was at UTEP for like two, three months after like after that Georgetown game. Like like when he died, I was like, we were in like out of town. Mm-hmm. I was literally like in Hawaii. Like we had just got to Hawaii. And we spent a week there. So when I get back, Jay's like buried, like he's already in the ground. Like the funeral just happened like the day before or something like that. So that, that was heartbreaking. So right. I we come back, I play Georgetown, we beat them. And from the time I spent all that time after the game with Jay at the at the grave site, I just from that point on, I just was emotionally done. Like I couldn't oh, I couldn't I couldn't play basketball. I couldn't I couldn't go to class. I couldn't answer the phone in my room, my apartment. I couldn't, I didn't come out for like months, like two two months. And then finally I started, I had a friend up there, like a, I had had a girlfriend up there and I had an assistant coach that was really good. Like Russ Bradbury would come by every day and check on me. And he would, he'd just leave me alone because he knew I was distraught. And that was just how that went. And then I, from that point on, I kind of finished the season, but it wasn't a great season for me. And then I went home and I just like had a baby and my girlfriend was pregnant at home and I stayed home and, and all the other things happened. So that was it. So did you kind of fall out of love? I know he was a lifelong friend, a, ch- a childhood friend of yours all the way through, you know, but did you kind of fall out of yeah. love with the yeah, game? Yeah, I did. Because like, he, I, you I'm know, he wasn't, you, like, I literally you know, didn't. there have a love for it the way I did before. Like, like Jay was so close to me, like literally like he was closer than like a brother to me. So when I lost him, it was like, I couldn't, the game meant really Mm -hmm. not the same to me. Like I didn't mind not playing. I didn't mind not really watching it. You know what I mean? I I used to watch and play. And even when Jay didn't want to play, he had to play, he had to watch it with me, had no choice. Well, I was going to beat him up anyway. He had to do it anyway. (laughs) <laughs> so that's how close so, we were. We were that close. So that was a process I, I, I had to go through as a man. I grew into manhood after that. Like literally, after that, I was just went into life right after that. 
So I know you, you know, you lost a very dear friend, but do you kind of like reflect on the, the times that you shared and kind of like, there was a time in the county where he was at Northwestern, you were at Parkdale and Mike Tate was at Oxford Hill and you guys kind of had a shootout for the uh, scoring title. Do you ever kind of go back and kind of think about that? Yeah, I look at that. Some guys sent me that on um, Facebook. I, I remember those days when like it was, it was, it was crazy how like Walt and them were at Crossland and Jay was at Northwestern and Mike was at Oxford Hill and Bryson was at Lager. I told you it was, a, it was an incredible time. Basketball was at its highest peak. I've never seen county basketball be like that since that time. And mm-hmm. that competition level was, because we, so, we were so close to each other. And since we were like 11 years old playing youth games together and growing up together and kind of knowing each other, we would call each other and talk trash before games and like Jay would be like, yeah, I'm going to kill y'all. And I was like, yo, you already know what's going to happen. Venable gone too, y'all done. <laughs> right. Yeah, and that's how it would be. And I told Mike the same thing. Mike was talking a bunch of trash about how many dunks he's going to get. I said, well, I bet you don't get enough dunks to get to get 50 points. Yeah. yeah I mean, you was putting up crazy numbers. And and like I said, I, I kind of consider that the golden era of PG County basketball. So many all met during that time period. And, you know, we don't really see the county have as many multiple all met at, on the same, you know, first team from that era, that 80, 86, 87, 88, 89 yeah, era. Right, exactly, even, exactly. Even, even Glenson, you mentioned Glenson Sydney. A lot of people from High Point, a lot of people don't realize, you know, he was first team all met. Yeah, twice. yeah he was all of it, too. I'm trying to tell you. He was, he was, yeah, that's he was a saying. problem, trust me. So I know you kind of fell out of love with the game. Um, anything after you tapped anything professionally? Did you try? Did you, you had, cause you had all this talent. Did you kind of just. Well, you know, I would, I, 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 I had, a, I had a kind of agent, Mike Brown. He was trying to get me to a couple of places that uh, I had another agent. I forgot his name. Um, Klein. I went to Portugal for like a couple of months. I didn't really like it there. Didn't know the language. So I came back home and that was the end of that. And the rest of the time I just been, now I have a son that I call, his name, I named him after Jay and Lennon that happened to, mm-hmm. to love the game the way I used to love it. So I'm, I'm living, I'm living mm-hmm. like right through him. Like he literally will get up at five in the morning and be up doing push-ups and stuff. When I get up at six, five thirty, he's like, Dad, can we go to the court? Mm-hmm. Can we go to the desk? I'll be like, yo, come on, man. Like, like, <laughs> like right through COVID, he's running every day. He's trying to get a shot somewhere every day. We like riding around, finding little spots to shoot. He out here shooting the wind blowing. He's still trying to make hundred shots in the wind and oh my god we out there for two three you know how you know how I, you know how i feel about him you know i love him i um i ran into him this summer he was getting some some bumps at the farm and you know not a lot of kids are gonna you know they're not gonna do that they're not gonna show up at the farms in that environment and play yeah, you know every yeah. chance they get I, you know that's one of the things i respect about you because i know that you're definitely gonna push him in in ways that you would push exactly in this, exactly in this in this day and age, and that's only going to make him better. Yeah. So you know, I always, I always every chance I get, you know, I always ask how he's doing, and I want, you know, I definitely want to see him do well. So you know, at the end of you know, you, you didn't do the overseas thing. Did you come home? Did you play Herbo? Did you continue to play Kenner? Did you play street ball games? Did you kind of just I just, say, just kind of yeah, just kind of was like a parent at the time. I kind of like was a dad and just. Trying to do that, I still played the wreck a lot. I still play ball all the time, but it was like at, at the right. wreck. It was kind of like in tournaments in the summer. I was like a hired gun. Like I would play for like like the guy that you ever know. You have you know Steve Fuller six from um, Good Hope. I would play with him, and we were just like playing tournaments. And I would just kill everybody, and then it was kind of like that that kind of thing where I would just play with only certain guys. I didn't play with everybody. Yeah. I didn't really like a lot of yeah. yeah. I just kind of stayed. And the guys who I really had love for is who I would play with, like I play for. But if I didn't have, like I just didn't do play. People would say, oh, why you don't want to play? Like I could go to a gym and watch everybody play and act like I never played. Like I'm like, no, I'll watch y'all. He said, come on, I'll just play. <laughs> like I'm like, nah. Then I could then I would play and just kill the whole gym. And I'd be like, see, why y'all want me to play? I don't know why you want me to play. Can none of y'all check me? I'll be talking to <laughs> And that's how, hey man, hey, that's how it was. I've heard stories. I've heard stories about you being a hired gun. They say if you're playing for the bag, go get Henry. Yeah. It's 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 a, hey look, it's un, it's without question. They say Henry Hall, yeah. like <laughs> real. Like I tell you, well, I, you hear what I said? Yeah. I said I played for. I, I was a hired gun, man. It was what it was. Like I know dudes that would wait 
to like the playoffs and come get me for like the playoffs and like Montana tournament, the the, the farms down the down to the down to the gates down to the I would just come in and it didn't really matter. Like I I didn't care who was out there. Right. So, um, you played in that bad game, that infamous bad game. You don't have to release any names. Right. right. But I've always just want I just always wanted to ask you. You're on one side, the other side is stacked. Did anyone on that other side disappoint you in how they performed under that pressure of that bad game? Mm, I'm gonna tell you what it was with them. They 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 couldn't come together. Like they played against me, Venable, Jay, and Ice, Brian Waller. And then we won one game, mm -hmm. one game we picked up Kurt. Another game we picked up, it was John Turner. And another game we picked up, it was Mike Morrison. But we all played together. Like, like, so them guys coming up with this guy, this guy, that guy, this guy from Southeast, these two from over here, Northwest. These are, no, they ain't never played together. No, no chemistry. chemistry. And I'm letting you know, when I make two shots in a row, no one on my team is going to shoot the ball but me. <laughs> So uh, another question about those bad games that I always wanted to ask is, uh, was there any pressure in losing, possibly losing? Or was it more so just a friendly, a real friendly competition with high well, stakes? The first one was high stakes and friendly, but the last two was like, the day was a pressure on them. It was pressure on them to beat us, and they never did. So you three straight yeah, to y'all. I'm not losing for no money. Not basketball. Some, somebody went home. Hey, look, somebody went home without without a bag. They was upset. A couple of dudes went home when I was one dude twice. Real, real known dude. Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. He, he took L's twice. He yeah. couldn't believe it. And I ended up with that dude. Like I ended up with him. Like, yeah, like it's my man now. Because he couldn't be he's like, man, I need man, I need to mess with Shawty, man. <laughs> yeah, like like what Shawty do? I didn't get with Shawty. So I played with him. Down the Sugar Ray Leonard tournament, I'm a, I I can drop names. I'm down. We down Palm Park in the Sugar Ray Leonard tournament with Rafe Edmonds, and it's me, mm -hmm. Smitty, Melvin, Earl Moore, Bootney, Alonzo Mourning, and the Kimbe and John Turner. Yeah, we ain't not, not losing. losing. Look, I don't care if, not if losing. Jesus Christ had a team, he's not beating us. Yeah. That's that's a that's a that team is two stack right there. And that's Rafe crazy. could really play. Like he was a knockdown, get you out your business, knock it down, splash. Like he didn't miss, Joe. Yeah. That's what everybody said. They say he was a legit oh, basketball nah, player that probably yeah. could have played played low major yeah. basketball. He could have went, to, Amer he went to American University or GW or yeah, for real. Yeah, that's I've heard I've heard they say that he was legit. Especially with the shooting Bucky. part, yes sir, or whatever. He able knocked to shoot that it. thing down, Slim. Trust yeah. what I'm saying. And Mel, and you know Melvin, yeah, that's Melvin can get anybody a shot. He could be on the wheelchair and get overshot with Melvin. Yeah, yeah, he. Melvin, a point pure, guard, that handles the pure right. point guard I ever seen. He had the best handles in my. I've never seen anybody like Melvin. I'm letting you know. I played a million places in a million place states in different countries. Melvin Middleton. Is the best I ever seen with a basketball in his hand. I've, I've, and I, I've you know, I've, seen, I've never seen anything like like Melvin. Nothing. You know, we had we've had that conversation. I definitely agree with you. It's not even. I mean, it's not even no. close. Like with some people that people be throwing out. And I, no disrespect. You know, I love I love Moochie, but Melvin just. You know, I love Jones, but Melvin just on another Dude, level. He's yo, just let me crazy. Tell you, none of them dudes that you just mentioned, and I love Moochie Norris. I love Greg Jones to death. Greg Jones is one of my favorite dudes. I love GG. That's my man. But back then, when you playing against Muggsy Bowes and San Cassell and them, then you playing against Lloyd Free and them on one team, and you got John Battle and them on another team, Lim with Lim Bias them on another team with these dudes. Melvin Middleton was out of high school. Carving them up. Carving the whole <laughs> shit to pieces. Like it was like he was playing around in there. Yeah, he was, it was his playground, especially oh that herbal. Oh and he God. was the 
he was the first person I ever seen get that Rondo yeah. treatment. I seen people back, I mean, back up all the way in the lane and dare him to shoot that yeah. elbow jump shot. But it wasn't, it was different than Rondo because he was coming at you 100 miles per hour. Slim, between the with leg. that thing, when I'm talking <laughs> about that thing dancing, I mean, he could dance with that thing, couldn't he, Joe? I mean, he was flying with it. Yeah, he, he, could, he was a layup artist. He yeah, was a layup. He, 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 I mean, the, the passes, passes was incredible. Oh passes. my God, Slim. He's, a, he's done shit I've never seen done before. And then on top of that, you put a boot knee with him. You put a, a curse. I mean, he getting like 20 on, assists man. off the rip. He got like, boot knee on one I, wing, Earl Moore on another, John Turner down there, Rayford ain't missing. I ain't missing. Alonzo ain't missing down there. If you throw it in there, it's a dunk every time. No one's getting a layup. No one. Him and DeKembe mm. was giving up no Speedy layups. You not, you, can you imagine the sugar in there turning in Palmer Park Gym? We got Alonzo Mourner and DeKembe starting with John Turner. That's, that's half a Georgetown team right now. Come on, man. And I'm out there starting. You know, I don't sit on nobody's bench. I never have, and I ain't never going to do that. I know that's right. Yeah, I seen Melvin make a spot of Speedy Jones. Remember Speedy Jones? Yeah, slot. That's my man. I, I, mean, I mean, just flat out running the wing. Just Melvin just dropping that shit to him like it wasn't nothing. Yeah, slob looking like a hundred, a hundred million dollars on that team. <laughs> change point guards, change point guards, it all changed. That's crazy. That dude was but special yeah, with the ball, I- man. Special, man. 